Hello, today we're going to talk about uh, Structure 3.2.10 and 3.2.11. These are HL topics only, and they both have to do with uh, proton nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, um, which I'm just going to call NMR spectroscopy. Um, and uh, we're going to look at the spectra today. Okay, so let's talk very briefly about what NMR spectroscopy is. Um, effectively, you're taking... Um, molecules, right, and you're exposing them to a magnetic field, right, and so there's a, that magnetic part is important. Certain nuclei are going to be able to switch to being in line, in like lined up with the magnetic field or opposite to the magnetic field, and when it's in line with the magnetic field, that is a lower energy state than when it is opposite to the magnetic field, right? And so we call this nuclear spin. And you'll have um, basically like in line or opposite. And the Nuclei can actually swap from being lined up with the magnetic field to being opposite, but it has to absorb some energy in order to do that. And depending on the atoms that you're testing, it could take more or less energy to do that. Um, but for, for this one, it typically only takes something like a radio wave to be able to switch it um, between one and the other. And the specific amount that it takes is what's going to show up in our NMR spectroscopy. And so for this course, we're going to focus really only on proton NMR spectroscopy, so the hydrogen atoms. And we're looking at how much it's going to take to get the hydrogen um, nuclei, the protons, to switch to being opposite to the magnetic field. Um, yeah, so, so this whole thing is really focused on the hydrogens, which becomes really useful for organic chemistry because we have a ton of hydrogen atoms. So there's kind of four pieces of information that we can get from a proton um, NMR spectroscopy. Uh, and the first one is the number of signals. And the number of signals tells us information about the number of hydrogen environments um, So an example would be something like methane. Methane is very simple, it's just CH4. All of those hydrogens are attached to the central carbon, and so they're all in the same what we call environment. They are all next to other hydrogens on the same carbon, and they're all kind of affected similarly by each other's spins. Okay. So this methane would have one hydrogen environment or just one signal when you're looking at the spectrum. Another one would be something like propane. And I'm going to draw out the hydrogen so you can see it because we're focused on hydrogens in this type. This propane has two hydrogen environments. These hydrogens that are on the end of the chain are the same as these hydrogens on the end of the chain because the molecule is symmetrical. So both of them, you know, are all, all six of those hydrogens are on the ends of the compound compared with these two hydrogens, um, so I'll label this as like number one, and these ones are number two. Those are both in the middle of the compound. So this one has two hydrogen environments. And then you can have something like, um, let's do propane again, but we'll change something up. Like this. This is uh, propane one all, and now this one has four signals. Okay, four different hydrogen environments. These three on the end carbon are all the same. These two in the middle are the same. These two on the carbon next to the hydroxyl group are the same, and this hydrogen on the end is is all on its own basically. So this one has four different signals. So the number of like 
scenarios, basically, that the hydrogen is. The number of environments refers to the number of peaks that you're going to get on the spectrum. So that's going to look something like four peaks versus methanes, just one peak, versus propanes, just two peaks. And we'll look at some more specific um, graphs, spectra, when we get into all of the details. Okay, so then in addition to the number of signals, how much those signals have shifted also matters. Um, so let's look at something like, like an ester. So this is ethyl ethanoate, right? And so this one has three hydrogen environments, one, two, three hydrogen environments, but they are affected by how close they are to other protons, other, other things that have that nuclear spin that is affected by the magnetic field. And so they're going to have a particular amount on the graph, and we're looking at the x-axis values here. So the um, value for this hydrogen that's next to the C double bond O of an ester is going to be different than the hydrogens next to the single bound oxygen. Um, and then the CH3 in the end is going to be different from either of those as well. And this information you can gather from the data booklet in section 21. So this is just a sample of the data booklet. I did not grab the whole image. There's a bunch of different types of hydrogen environments. Um, but you'll see this chemical shift, and effectively they are comparing it to this, this baseline molecule called tetramethylsilane. And that's where if you have a, a silicon in the middle and you have four methane groups, or four methyl groups rather, all 12 of those hydrogen atoms are all in the same environment. And we essentially say whatever its value that shows up in the NMR spectrum, we set that to zero. And then we compare every other thing to that tetramethylsilane. Um, and we say, so how much has it shifted from TMS? So if we were to think back to that um, ethyl thanoate on the last slide, the hydrogens next to the C double bond O in an ester um, are going to be here, right next to the C double bond O in an ester. So it's going to show up as a 2 to 2.5 shift. Whereas the hydrogens next to the single bound O in an ester is going to have a shift of 3.7 to 4.8 in that range. And then you have the CH3s, which are going to have a shift of 0.9 to 1. So that gives you an idea of where the signals are going to be on the spectra for the x-axis. Um, and then the third piece of information you can gather from these graphs is the size of the peak or the integration area. Um, this can be a little harder to see on real graphs, in my opinion. Um, so let's look at an example of something like ethanol. So we have two hydrogen environments here, these three hydrogens on the end carbon and this one hydrogen next to the C double bond O. Because, so these are, there's two peaks effectively on our graph, right? So you're going to see one peak that's relatively small because there's only one hydrogen and you'll see another peak that's relatively high. Um, it should be effectively three times as high in terms of its integration area. Um, now, sometimes what they'll do is they'll put like what almost looks like an, like an integral symbol on top, um, but the, they, they'll sometimes just label it so you can see how many times bigger one is from the other. Um, or sometimes they'll do like a simplified version of an NMR spectra that very easily and clearly shows how many times bigger the peak is. Um, either way, you're going to have more signal when there's more hydrogens in that particular environment. 
Now, the last bit of information you can get from a proton atom R spectra is the splitting pattern. And that has to do with how many hydrogens are next to the hydrogens that we're focused on. So let's look at an example of what that means. Um, so let's take, let's do propanoic acid. Okay, so there's my carboxylic acid. There are three hydrogen environments. One, two, three. Okay. And they're all going to have a different shift because they're slightly different environments. And they're going to have different integration areas because you have three hydrogens versus two hydrogens versus one hydrogen. But they're also going to have different splitting patterns. So this set of hydrogens is next to two hydrogens. And you always just add one. So since there are two hydrogens next to it, it's going to form a triplet splitting pattern. These two hydrogens in the middle are next to a carbon with three hydrogens. So three plus one is four. That makes a quartet. And this hydrogen is next to a carbon with zero hydrogens. Zero plus one is one, so that makes a singlet. So what that looks like on the graph is the singlet will just look like a single line. The triplet will look like three. And the quartet will look like four, kind of like that. So, and again, it tells you how many hydrogens are next to it if you subtract one line. Okay, so let's start um, looking at some examples for proton NMR spectroscopy. So I have butane and butane one all butane. So I have CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. Butane has only two signals because these hydrogens are identical in the center because the molecule is symmetrical, just the same um, in relation to each other. The, also, the end hydrogens are in an environment as well. So there's one, two signals for butane. For butane one all, uh, oops, I wrote a three. That should be a CH2. Like that. That would be butane one all with the um, hydroxyl group on one end of the chain. You're going to see that this hydrogen is different from this one, 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 um, because they all are slightly different environments. This one is on directly bound to the oxygen. The CH2 is next to a hydroxyl group and a propyl chain. Um, these hydrogens in the, in the middle there are next to a methyl and a hydroxyl group together. This one's next to just ethyl and et cetera. So you'll see five different hydrogen environments for butane one all. Now in this example, um, we've got methyl propanoate, so it's an ester. And we've got our methyl group and then propanoate. So there's three carbons here. And so it looks like there are three hydrogen environments. One, two, three hydrogen environments. And based on our data booklet, so we have hydrogens that are next to that single bound oxygen in an ester, um, or somewhere in the 3.7 to 4.8 range. It says to predict the chemical shift though, so you need to be careful. I would pick an actual value in that range. You could say something like four. Doesn't really matter as long as it fits in that range. The next one over, these middle hydrogens are next to the C double bond O in the ester. So this falls on our data booklet in the 2 to 2.5 range. So maybe we say it's 2.2. You can pick any number in that range though. And then the last one, the CH3, is on the end of our chain. So it's going to be somewhere in the 0.9 to 1 range. So I'm just going to say it's 0.9. 
and so that's how you would predict the actual chemical shift. All right, here's one more example. We've got an NMR spectrum of a compound that has the molecular formula C3H8O. Um, and it says to draw the full structural formulas and give the names of three possible isomers. Uh, so we could have a propanol like that. Um, we could have propan 2 all, where the alcohol group is in the center. Um, or we could even have an ether. We could have a CH3, CH2, O, CH3. So those are three possible isomers, propan-1-ol, propan-2-ol, or um, this methoxyethane. And it says to identify um, the unknown compound from the number of signals in the spectrum. So let's start at the top here. This one has one, two, three, four signals. This one uh, down here, um, I drew it a little weird, but let's see if I can draw it in a way that makes a little bit more sense. Um, it makes it easier for us to see what's going on. This one has one, two, three. These end hydrogens, it's kind of weird drawing, but the end hydrogens are the same because the compound is symmetrical. So those end hydrogens will give off just a single environment, single, single, sig single signal. So this one has three signals. And this last one, the ether, will have one, two, three signals as well. And if we look at our spectra, there are four signals given. One, two, three, four. So I know that it has to be the propan one all, this one at the top here, because it has the correct number of signals. Then it says uh, identify, the, um, identify the group responsible for the signal at point nine. So that's this one right here. And um, if we're using the data booklet, chemical shift in that 0.9 to 1 range is the CH3 group. So it must be these hydrogens here at the end are giving that 0.9 signal, um, which, which is useful. So then you, can, you could match the other ones if you, if you wanted to, but um, it only asks you to identify the one at 0.9. And there you go.